down in the woods today. Is sure of a big surprise. <laughs> I lived in southern Delaware, about 13 years in a pretty woodsy area. It was about 15 minutes to the nearest small town and 40 to the nearest smaller city. My house was surrounded by a nature preserve that allowed hunting by special permit and I used to play in the woods for hours as a kid. Part of the nature preserve, about a half a mile away, had a vehicle trail you could go on with your truck, ATV, etc. and had a few abandoned fields. Occasionally, I'd walk up there by myself just to enjoy nature. One of my favorite areas was an old farming field with a tiny pond surrounded by pine forest. This area is blocked off by large pieces of concrete fence and is not accessible by vehicle. This is important. I recently visited the area after not exploring it for three to four years and brought my fiance with me. I took her to the area mentioned above as I used to find cool rocks and sometimes animal bones to take home since I'm into vulture culture and wanted to show her my favorite childhood quiet area. We started looking for bones, and hey, we found some remains of a doe, and more, and another. All together, there were the skeletons of around five deer, some bucks, some does. Now, while hunting is allowed in parts of the preserve, it is not in this area. Also, when you hunt, you're required to field dress, remove organs. In the area of death, and take the rest of the carcass with you as most hunters around there hunt for food. These were not full skeletons, just bits and pieces. We found three partial skulls, so it wasn't just trophy hunters taking down a buck or doe for a mount, and the remains were all in about a six foot radius. If it was hunters, they'd have to take the entire carcass with them by walking the mile back to the main trail clean and butchered the deer elsewhere, then return and carried the butchered remains back to the area and dump it in one specific point, and also not dump the entire skeleton. We're a bit freaked out at this point, and then realize that the forest is almost entirely quiet, except a few quail calls. As a kid, I used to hear train whistles in the area. There are no trains in the area except some cargo rails that ran three to four times a year about 15 miles away, and remembered the silence that came after those calls. We were thoroughly creeped out by the weird bone area and the unusual quiet, so we speed walked back to the vehicle trail, got in my car, and drove back to my family's house. We don't plan on going back. My wife, sister and I are all avid backpackers. We spend a lot of time in the outdoors. But back in 2018-ish, we decided to do pull-up camping with stargazing in Colorado as the main goal. We're from the Midwest. We used a light pollution map to find a remote camping area in San Juan National Forest and plan to hike during the day and stargaze at night. The first day and night, the stars and trails were amazing and we were all super stoked to be in the mountains and away from flat land. It was the clearest I have ever seen the Milky Way galaxy, and it was phenomenal. After the first night, we all got up early and decided to do another hike, this time following a small dirt road through the mountains. We all were having a great time, and there was nothing but positive vibes. I mentioned that our hike felt more like a walk since we were on a road, so we all agreed to take the first proper trail we came across. We had a GPS unit, map, and compass, so we weren't worried about getting lost. We finally came across a trail that ran perpendicular to the road and had a slight gradient running down the mountain. Staying true to our word, we all agreed to see where it went and turned onto the trail. As soon as we left the road and stepped onto the trail, I had an unprovoked and overwhelming feeling of doom come over me. 
Suddenly, my excitement left me and I felt, almost instinctually, that I would be in serious danger if I went down this trail. This unprovoked feeling of doom was strange enough, but when my sister said, guys, I don't think we should go down this trail, and my wife responded, oh my god, do you feel that too? I lost it. We quickly returned to the road and continued our walk. We all agreed we had the same unprovoked sensation once we stepped onto the trail and could not come up with a logical explanation. I'm a former long-time airborne ranger, having served for many years in 2 75 in Washington state. After my service, I was a forest service firefighter and disaster response contractor. Suffice to say, I am a very experienced outdoorsman, professionally trained. In 2019, I was hiking in the Voyerhäuser Forest Reserve near Offutt Lake in western Washington state. The preserve was adjacent to the home of a buddy's father. And before setting off into the lumber preserve, his father had implored for me to not go hiking in there alone, as it was a very dangerous area, a very frightening area. He had lived there for 30 years and refused to let his kids ever step foot into the forest. Being a young, confident ranger, I laughed off his superstition and headed out into the virgin forest. It was an unusually hot and humid day in late spring, and I was armed with a Glock 19 9mm pistol and feeling very capable and competent. I had made it about three miles into the forest and came to a massive bowl section of perfectly manicured pine forest with no undergrowth, just tan spruce pine needle bed as far as the eye could see. It looked like I was stepping down into a forest bowl the size of a modern football stadium. I got about halfway down into the bowl and literally every sound in the forest became totally, totally, deafeningly silent. All in an instant. It was as though I had stepped into a soundproof studio room in one step. No bugs, no wind, no ambient sound, nothing. By this time, I had been to combat twice and graduated ranger school and was a pretty salty individual. But I am not ashamed to admit I was overcome with a feeling of fear dread, deep guttural paralyzing fear. I gathered myself together and turned around and practically ran the entire way back to Curtis's father's house, got into my truck and left, and never went back. I've spent years thinking about what happened in those woods, and to this day I have no answers. I was completely sober, fully aware of my surroundings, and in good spirits and health at the time of this incident with no mental, physical, or psychological issues. I cannot say what the incident was caused by, but I have never been so deeply in fear in my life. Even thinking about it now, over a decade later, makes me feel uneasy, as though whatever was in that forest is still there. All this, I swear on my scroll to be true. I've never been a non-believer, but I have to see it to believe it. Although I am open to the unexplainable and enjoy reading about it, I also love when something is debunked. I have always found the scariest things to be people. This experience might have something to do with the way I perceive things now. It happened in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s. I was probably between eight and 10 years old and in the Cub Scouts. Our troop would pretty much always go to the same campground. They had maybe 10 big cabins. Each cabin had a small kitchen, a dining area with four to six picnic tables, and a giant room with about a dozen bunk bed cots lined up along the two walls. There would be a burning stove in the center. In our troop, all of the boys' dads would go camping too. The dads would take the bottom bunk and the boys would be on the top. 
This particular time, we got a corner bunk closest to the front door. My best friend and his dad, a Vietnam vet and tough guy, were the next bunk over. A little about me. I was always a very shy and socially anxious person. I only ever spoke when spoken to by an adult and only really talked much with my best friend. I was also kind of a sissy and still am. These were just one-nighter camping trips and after a normal day, it's now bedtime. It's cold out, so there is a fire in the stove casting a warm reddish glow around the big room. However, it's still dark inside. I can't remember if I couldn't fall asleep or if I woke up, but I was awake. The whole room was dimly lit up, and it was like shooting stars in a light show all above the room, in the peaks above the bunks. It was like a massive party. I can't believe it, and look over at my friend to see if he's awake. He is sound asleep. I look back at the light show, and a dimly lit white light swoops down and comes towards me. As it gets closer, I see a dimly lit white girl's face, but with big black circles as eyes, about two or three inches. Her face is about a foot from mine, and we just stare at each other. It was kind of like the ghostly apparition that came out of the ark in Indiana Jones, but she didn't transform and was not menacing. I don't remember if she was floating or if I was looking down at her on the floor as she looked up at me. I don't do or say anything. I don't scream or try to wake anyone up. I'm not sure if I was frozen or didn't want to bother anyone. I was more curious, like, what is going on? This is weird. After staring at each other for maybe a minute or two, I start to freak out, wondering what I should do. I decide to just turn my back on the situation. I roll over, face the wall, and close my eyes. Eventually, I fell asleep. We all got up the next morning and left. I did not feel good, and I did not tell anyone about what happened. A couple of years later, on another camping trip, some of the kids were talking about ghosts, and I guess there was a rumor that one of those cabins was haunted. I think I know which one. First things first, English is not my main language and I'm on a cell phone, so I apologize in advance. I, 27 female, live in a small town in North Italy, a valley between our typical old mountains, round shapes covered in forest, not high. So, just behind my home, lots of hikes start. I always lived here, and I like mountains, plus I'm getting in shape so the terrain is ideal, especially because I'm really familiar with it. So last summer, I was walking my usual route, when I thought I could try to have a short hike before sunset, and took a different route. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Italian ground, but... There aren't the big spaces and long distances typically of US, I imagine. Picture the average small town of 2,500 people. Starting from the bottom, after a two to three hour hike, you're on top of the mountain. And the route I took was about 30 minutes to arrive halfway up the mountain to a big Christian cross and a nice view. I was with my dog, a well-trained spritz, a nice company with good instincts that I trust. He's a working dog more than a pet, despite his size. So we took the path and started making our way up, nice and relaxed, but active as we didn't have too much light left in the day. I just figured that if light went low, I'd just turn around and head home, no chances of getting lost. Woods immediately engulf us, pretty dense but it's the norm. Not even 15 minutes of walking and I'm paralyzed with this overwhelming sense of dread. The woods are completely silent, my skin crawls up just thinking about it. Even my dog stops, anxious. I just couldn't understand what was scaring me so much, in the sudden silence. I couldn't move a muscle. I've read The Gift of Fear, and the only time I didn't listen to my gut, I lost my spleen in an accident. 
So wide-eyed and hyper-alert, I forced myself to move and noped out of there. It was like my brain was screaming, if you stay here you'll die. Walking back, I couldn't stop the urge to continuously look behind me. At some point I was practically running, and I kept thinking that if I sprained an ankle there, I would die. The dog seemed relieved when we had turned back, and he kept looking behind too. When we finally made it out of the woods and back to the road, I felt a wave of relief and ran all the way back home due to all the adrenaline I had. To this day, I don't know what happened and I haven't gone back. Author's Notes We don't really have apex predators here. Recently there have been problems with some bears but in different regions of the mine, so I'm more prone to believe that maybe it was the presence of another person to scare me. The spleen comment refers to an incident I had in 2008 when I was 11 or 12 on horseback. That day, I just knew I should have absolutely avoided riding. I had a sense of dread, but as a young girl, I let my grandma convince me. She was the one paying for the lessons, and I went, ignoring my instinct for the first time, and I kept ignoring it through some other issues that ultimately led to the accident itself, like a domino effect. I was lucky to be alive. Eight hours of surgery and minus one spleen later. Figured I'd post the most unnerving thing that's happened to me in the woods, and the only incident where I was fully aware and believed my life was in danger. This happened in southern Kentucky, in Wayne County. Specifically, what I was told was Edwards Mountain. This happened in the fall, and I was around 19 at the time. My friend Kay showed me this mountain range kind of location where a cave was. We had started to get heavy into caving, and if you know anything about the area, feel free to look it up. The entire county is riddled with cave systems. Ridiculously so. We used to keep a map of all the ones we found or could feasibly get to. Disclaimer that this is dangerous. Not much you can do to be disrespectful of the area, which you should be respectful and do it safely, but most country people dig the hell out of them, or use them as trash dumps anyways. Some of the caves I know of are very dangerous and it's a miracle none of us were ever harmed. Also, there are toxic caves. This cave was kinda odd. It was a large cavern but part of me hesitates to even call it a cave because it was kind of like a cliff overhang as well, but you could definitely walk inside to a central chamber that was bigger than most apartments, and there was a tunnel you could exit on the left-hand back area if you shimmy squeezed yourself through. It's not far off from the road at least, it's on a backcountry road, and there's a small gravel road you could turn off on. This road goes into the woods and banks up and left and keeps going. I've never seen what's at the end of it. Generally you park at the bend, and the mouth is up an embankment. I've been here twice before with Kay and never ran into other people. I never saw anything of note. We never really thoroughly explored the area either, which I wanted to do. I wanted to hike along the ridge to see if there were any other entrances. He was never interested because he thought the place was boring and had been there multiple times before since it was essentially in his neck of the woods. So another friend and I, Jay, are hanging out and I've managed to get him onto the caving adventure hype train. So I suggest we go check this place out and walk along the ridge. We take his car, he brings his handgun, Jay was 23 at the time. We take his car and get to the gravel road and as we're coming in, a small pickup truck is coming out. An older, haggy looking woman is driving. Jay was driving a small car so we couldn't get too far off the road lest we get stuck. She wouldn't budge and let us around. Jay starts to get aggravated and cussing to himself, and she just mean mugs us. After a few minutes, she finally yields and pulls to the side enough to let us pass. At this point, I would like to note that, as far as I knew, no one lived back there. Or at least, I was never told anyone did. And there were no signs of any kind posted about private property. The gravel road had no name. As far as we were concerned, it was perfectly fine to be there, 
and new people came up here often. Jay and I park the car at the bend and get out. We check out the main chamber where there's an old fire and start to walk around the ridge on the left hand side. Three things of note. We did find a sifter. Not unusual. People dig for arrowheads and pottery in this county all the time. I smell the distinct ghastly smell of bone marrow. I assume there's a dead animal but I can't find any carcass and the smell is strong. I figure since vultures are very common and nest in the cliffy areas there must be a nest somewhere with a carcass in it. We find a rope anchored on an extremely steep part of the cliff where there are no handholds to easily climb it. So naturally we climb up the rope. At the top is a flat area with a chair. From there, you can climb a little higher on some other levels, but it didn't really go anywhere. From here, we are now pretty high up, like three or four stories, and can clearly see the parked car from above. This is when a different shitty pickup truck comes peeling down the gravel road from the main road. At first, we don't think anything of it, until it stops a little ways in front of our car, and a guy gets out with a rifle. He walks down to our car, and starts looking in the windows and surveys the surrounding area. Luckily, never looking up. At this point we crouch and just watch. Then another guy in the truck steps out, also with a rifle, and shouts, Did you find him? I don't see them anywhere. Let's keep looking. He goes back to the truck, gets in and they drive off up the road. As soon as they were out of sight, we both scaled down the cliff as fast as we could and booked it back to the car. We took off and have never been back. Not sure if it was private property or some illegal shit they had going on, but I am completely convinced they were looking for us and would not have hesitated to shoot us. It seems they knew we were there and part of me is convinced that Mean Mug Lady tipped them off. You hear stories all the time about people getting shot over pot patches in the middle of the woods. And I have seen one pot patch in the woods. But this was fairly close to a main road. Maybe it was private property and we didn't know. But there's definitely better ways to go about it. And country people can be absolutely off in the head. This is a series of weird and creepy events that happened to me and my mates across the past week and a half, and all came to a head last night. So I'll preface this story with the fact that I'm traditionally not a very spiritual person. I've always been quite cynical about paranormal activity, and even though I know that there may be some things beyond our understanding, I've always believed that there's usually a very logical, scientific reason for most paranormal occurrences. Everyone in my friendship group also shared this view until what happened the other night. So my mates, my boyfriend and I, live on a uni residence which is surrounded by a dense Australian forest. I've been here for a year now and have enjoyed going on multiple bushwalks, both during the day and night. I grew up surrounded by bush. My high school was on 200 acres of bush and I live on a country property in the middle of nowhere. So at this point, the land and the forest have become my safe space. I've been in the uni forest plenty of times to take a breather from uni stress and I've never noticed anything sinister in there. Over the past few weeks, my boyfriend and his mates have been building a pretty impressive fort in the bush They've spent every free minute taking an axe to old dead logs and building this fort, which is about the size of a caravan. Understandably, they're pretty proud of this creation. So last night, they decided to show some third years what they've been working on. As they were walking towards the fort, these third years stopped and told us they didn't want to go further. They told us that they had had some bad experiences in that section of the forest and they said they were too scared to venture in. It was about midnight at this point, so it was very dark. I thought these third years were merely pranking us, so I began joking and making light of the situation. To my surprise though, 
My boyfriend, Matt, and best friend, Darcy, were very accommodating of the third year's fear and told them they'd be happy to accompany them out of the bush. They oddly seemed kind of freaked out themselves. I then remembered that Matt had actually told me before that the bush could be quite scary at night, which actually amused me because usually he's the type of annoying macho man who believes that fear is a sign of weakness. One of the third years, Nick, wanted to press on, but the other two, Kyle and Adam, wanted to head back. I had seen the fort a few times, so I volunteered to go back with Kyle and Adam. As we were leaving the forest, I asked Kyle and Adam what made them so scared of the forest. They told me that they didn't want to talk about it while we were in there, but they did point out to me that the section of forest we were in was unnaturally still and quiet. As a cynical person, I had to admit that it was a bit odd that only the section we were in was dead still. Whereas about 20 meters away, across the road, the trees were blowing madly in the wind. Once we had left the forest, Kyle and Adam's demeanor changed significantly and they finally felt comfortable expressing to me what they had experienced in the bush before. Very long story short, Across the three years they had lived on residence, they and a few other people have had multiple encounters with what seemed to be an odd looking spirit in the shape of a man in a hunched over position. The spirit was always accompanied by the bush going unnaturally silent and an overwhelming feeling of impending evil and doom. He told me that the reason the forest goes so still and quiet is because something inside of it is listening to you and hunting you. Kyle, being a man of indigenous culture, told me that at one point, the spirit was so close to one of his friends that he had to call in an aboriginal elder to run a smoking ceremony. This elder told Kyle that the presence of the evil was overwhelming in the forest and she warned him never to go in too deep again. Kyle also began educating me about other aboriginal legends and expressing his fear for the noises, like screams and whistles, distinctly human screams and whistles, not foxes or birds, and the feelings he had experienced in the bush. At this point, I'm listening ardently, but was also viewing these stories as purely fictitious, as opposed to something to be concerned about. Even though I didn't really believe in the stories, I was interested in learning more about the Aboriginal culture and I was honored that Kyle was opening up to me about something which seemed to be very personal and significant to him. About half an hour later, Matt, Darcy and Nick emerged from the forest and headed back over to us. As they approached, I could tell that they seemed pretty obviously shaken by something and for the first time that night, I suddenly felt very anxious. Matt and Darcy explained that they were showing Nick the fort when they all of a sudden felt an overwhelming feeling of dread and they all unanimously decided that they needed to leave. Matt also admitted to momentarily catching a glimpse of what he said looked like a hunched over man in front of a tree near the fort. He said he would have thought it was a shadow had he not seen the man's eyes reflect the light of his torch. At this point, my belief that they were pranking us diminished entirely as Kyle was visibly freaking out and Matt looked shaken. I could tell they weren't acting and I also didn't believe Kyle would exploit his own culture for the sake of a cheap joke. We all now headed back to our respective dorms as we figured we'd better get as far from the forest as possible. I felt much better to be inside only until Matt turned to me and suddenly said, I need to go back and talk to Kyle. When I looked into his eyes, I could tell something was very wrong and my anxiety amped up significantly. Him behaving this way was very unusual and something was clearly bothering him. So we headed over to Kyle's unit and knocked on the door to his room. Matt explained to both of us that two days prior, he had come across a massive tree in the clearing that was covered in some odd sorts of bulbs. Him being an absolute moron, decided it would be a very clever idea to take an ax to the bulbs to see what they were made of. 
He admitted that the reason he was asking Carl about it was because he couldn't shake the memory or thought of this tree, and it was becoming unbearable and stressful. Kyle was obviously furious about this, as it turned out that the tree Matt had damaged was very sacred and ancient, and Kyle believed that Matt might have angered the forest and the spirits within it. He asked Matt if he had experienced any incidents over the past few days, and Matt matter-of-factly told us that the gash on his face, caused by a falling branch that missed his eye by a mere centimeter, actually happened only 20 minutes after he axed the tree. He also told Kyle that he had lied when he initially told us that he'd seen the hunched man for the first time tonight. He had in fact seen him three times over the course of the past week and twice in the past two days. He also told us that the reason he left the forest the night of axing the tree, besides the fact he had a bleeding cut on his face, was because all of the boys working on the fort had suddenly heard a very, very unnatural sound in the forest. Something between a human scream and a whistle. They said they would have thought it was an animal, had everything else not suddenly gone completely silent. When they heard the noise again, closer this time, they grabbed their stuff and legged it. It was also at this point when I realized that over the past two days, and I could literally pin it to whenever Matt was around. I had felt extremely agitated and sad. It was a very intense feeling, and I felt really guilty because it was nothing Matt was doing to upset me that was causing my distress. It was as simple as it being his energy or vibe that was bothering me. I love this man. We've never had any arguments, but the night after he axed the tree, which he didn't tell me about, and which I don't condone by the way. I remember feeling such a distinct feeling of discomfort whenever he was around me. It got so bad at one point that I locked myself in my room and cried all night about it. I was confused and sad that the person I loved was making me this distressed when he seemingly did nothing wrong. I pinned it on my period, except that it's not due for another week and usually doesn't cause such emotional deregulation. I'm still not necessarily saying that the tree and Matt's energy were linked, but it was a feeling that was so weird to me and so unexplainable to begin with, so this almost made sense to me. Kyle told Matt that he and I and everyone else involved in making the fort needed to get saged as quickly as possible to ward off any evil spirits around him. Matt despite his initial disbelief, agreed immediately. We met with another Aboriginal student, Ash, and their partner, Key, and they provided the sage. Before the ceremony, Key told us that they were going to go gauge the vibes, and Ash told us that Key had an innate ability to feel spirits in the wind. The second that Key walked out of the unit, I swear to God that the wind did one of the weirdest things I have ever experienced. It was the biggest gust of wind so far, and it carried the faintest howl of about five different notes and octaves. It came from well beyond the tree line like a wave, and flew unnaturally quickly in our direction. It flew through me as if collecting my shadow, and it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It didn't feel sinister though, and Key reassured us that it was a normal phenomenon, and that they experience it whenever in touch with the spirits. What wasn't normal though, was the smell that permeated in the air about 30 meters from the tree line. It was almost artificial, like nothing I'd smelt before, and it very clearly scared Key as they began to tell us that something was very, very wrong. They told us that something was stalking us from just beyond the tree line and that it was very, very angry. Apparently, we needed to begin to sage now or else it would follow us into the residence. As we walked to the glow of a nearby lamppost, Key told us that it was too late and that the evil thing was already following us. And that was when the brand new and relatively expensive lighter we had recently bought broke. It just completely broke. We tried to light the sage and the button fell off and the thing cracked open. 
We now needed a new lighter, and Key told us the thing was getting closer and closer. Whether it was related or not, I couldn't stop shaking despite being warm under a lot of layers of clothing. As a pack, we headed to a room to get a new lighter, and Ash advised us that Matt should stand away as we tried to light the sage. After a couple of attempts where the fire bent around the sage, and I mean literally, was repelled by the stick, Matt stood far enough away, and it lit. Once we were all fully saged, we were feeling significantly better and were ready to sleep. It was probably about 2.30 a.m. at this point. I got back to Matt's room, now completely comfortable around him for the first time in two days, and we got into bed. The other two people in our room were already asleep. Matt and I talked for a while about random stuff, nothing ghostly, and I ended up feeling very comfortable and happy as we eventually stopped talking and he drifted off. As a bit of an insomniac, it takes me a while to doze off, so usually I go on my phone until I feel sleepy. That was when it happened. It started with a very faint tap that I paid not much mind to, but in hindsight, didn't have a known source. Then the dogs from the suburb across from the uni went nuts. It was a very faint sound, but they were disturbed nonetheless. Nothing made me think that it was anything paranormal, until multiple things happened at once. The room went very still and silent, as if a ward of cotton had been placed in the air. The heater stopped, the faint noises of breathing stopped, even Matt next to me was silent. And then, my legs went icy, icy cold. Unnaturally cold. The rest of my body was warm, but legs were freezing. Then my whole body, just as suddenly, became uncomfortably hot. Initially, I was worried I was having a stroke or a heart attack or something. Finally, an all-consuming, overwhelming, intense feeling of evil permeated everything. It was evil and angry, and like nothing I had ever felt before. I couldn't link it to a specific spot in the room, but I knew it was strongest near Matt. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't speak. I knew it wasn't sleep paralysis because I had been on my phone the whole time and was not remotely asleep. I could also move freely and didn't feel paralyzed. I sat bolt upright and felt a panic attack coming on. I'm usually not one to cry very easily, but I'm never one to have a panic attack, but this rendered me both. I was sitting upright and praying, with everything I could think of for this to go away. I was shaking and crying. I didn't want to wake the others to ask them if they could feel it, because I knew that would anger it. I didn't end up needing to wake them though, because matter woke suddenly with a start. It scared the life out of me, because his voice cut the silence, but he was just asking if I was okay. I was not okay. The thing was now feeling more evil than ever. I couldn't speak. I just sat there, more terrified than I've ever been in my life. Matt then went dead still and said to me, You feel that, right? I couldn't even nod. I was praying with everything I could muster. I'm not even religious but I was calling on all the limited things I knew about religion, God, Jesus, angels, etc. I was repeating in my mind that I meant the thing no harm and that I'm sorry if I offended it. All I remember saying aloud is, something is very, very bad. And Matt just nodded, looking terrified. Eventually, what felt like a lifetime of prayers, the feeling began diminishing and everything slowly felt calm again. Noise returned, the breathing of the others in the dorm, the heater cranked on, the wind outside resumed. Whatever it was seemed to have left. Once I felt safe enough to lie down, Matt and I snuggled up together and tried our best to fall asleep. I was worried the thing would return when Matt fell asleep in order to attack him when he was vulnerable, but it didn't thank God. My sleep was riddled with nightmares about spirits and I woke up unusually early. In the morning though, I seemed to feel okay. 
Matt and I talked and he reckons we both were freaked out off the back of a really creepy night. What's weird though is that before that encounter or whatever it was, I was not even remotely scared. To be honest, when I went to bed that night, I was still pretty skeptical there was even a spirit to begin with. Not that morning though. I'm still convinced that it was a spirit in that room that night. I have never, ever felt anything like the fear I felt in that situation. I've watched horror movies. I've intentionally freaked myself out in creepy places before. And only that night did I feel any sort of presence. I can't entirely describe it. I asked Kyle, Ash and Key that morning if we should be concerned about it visiting our room and they told us that if whatever it was wanted to hurt us, it would have done so. They said they believe it was more of a warning for us to leave it alone, more of a threat than an act of violence. We also then discovered, as Darcy went back into the bush that day, Matt and I declined the invite, that their well-structured, carefully constructed fort that could carry the weight of all of them had collapsed in the night. It wasn't a stormy night, it wasn't any more windy than any other night had been. The fort had entirely caved in on itself, as if having been trampled on by a large creature. Whether these things are coincidental or not, I'm not sure, but it sure freaked me the hell out. I haven't had any odd experiences since, but I also haven't gone back into the forest since. I still don't know whether or not I want to. Since I've already posted the scariest thing that's happened, I figured I would share some brief stories that are not deserving of their own post. Obligatory, these are true. Relevant info, all of these take place in southern Kentucky, between the ages of 19 to 24. Generally, my partner in crime, Kay, is usually always involved. Whistling in the woods. There's a lookout point down the road Kay used to live that he loved to go to all the time. Will not reveal location because it's too close to where his family lives. Had to hike about 30 minutes up our mountainside to get to it. Decent little hike. We decided to go up one day and ended up dicking around too long and underestimated how quickly it gets dark. Kay is terrified of being in the woods after dark. There is no particular reason for this but his imagination is a little bit too healthy. He's scared of shit like Wendigos while I'm scared of crazy Leroy with a shotgun, or more specifically, his crazy uncle. His irrational fears have worked against me on multiple occasions. So, we start trying to make it down the mountain, in complete darkness, as quickly and safely as we possibly could. We didn't anticipate this, and our only source of light was his cheap ass cell phone, which he insisted on clutching. He's whimpering and crying to himself the entire way, which isn't helping my nerves. Then, we hear a whistle. Just a short whistle, from behind and a little off to the side. Another whistle answers, this time in front of us. A call and response ensues, and this continues to follow us all the way down the mountain. Once we get to the road, it stops. I've always been told that bobcats do this, and were likely following us the whole way, which, in a way, seems scarier than if they had screamed. Edit. After digging further into it, on whether it was bobcats, it may have been something worse. It's rare to see or hear of mountain lions in Kentucky. I've mostly heard of them being in the eastern part, but they are in Kentucky. My best uneducated guess is that it was potentially a mother teaching a cub to stalk us without alerting us of their presence. Or they were calling each other to keep track of where they were. Final destination, nature hike. This one's brief and a lesson on being extra cautious of your surroundings in the woods and clear communication. Kay, myself and our friend Red were out hiking on private property that Red's friend gave us access to. We're hiking to a specific cliff overhang Red wants to check out. It's fairly flat through his area, lots of thin trees. Red tells us to be careful where we step. That's it, just a 
Watch where you step. I trip on a root and Red snatches me by the backpack, holding me and keeping me from falling. Then I see the tree stump spikes. Beavers. That's when I noticed several small tree stumps that had all been chewed by beavers and were essentially spikes. Fall on them and your ass is impaled. Heads. This is just about shitty hunters. This actually happened when I was eight visiting my grandparents prior to moving to the area. We decided to go camping on Lake Cumberland. We're heading the location on my grandfather's boat extremely early in the morning. There's fog on the lake. We pass an embankment and someone had left three severed deer heads at the water's edge. One was a buck which is kind of dumb because isn't that the thing you want to mount? That's it. Just a stark and unsettling thing to see for a child's first camping experience. Hello watchers and listeners, thank you so much for watching. As always a big thank you to all of the Reddit users who kindly allowed me to use their stories. If you want to help support this channel, you will find links to both my Patreon and my Teespring store in the description below. So feel free to have a look. And the biggest thank you to all of you who continue to support me. I truly do appreciate it. And remember, Papa loves you.